Natural theology. What is it? Why does it matter? Let's talk about it with Dr. N.T. Wright on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. We are so glad you're here. I'm Steve, the old white guy. Uh, our resident megachurch pastor, Zach Van Dyke, is here, as is Eric Gusman. You know, we're supposed to confess to each other, and Eric, <clears throat> I think Zach has something he wants to say to you. Oh. Okay. Oh, man. Well, I, uh, I'm just now starting to watch the Star Wars movies, uh, and I, I'm not really into it. They're just, they're fine. I, you know, I don't get it. You are deficient in some way, okay, sir. Right, right. Didn't right. do it for you, <laughs> you huh, Zach? Though, now, it's, right? it's, okay. it's, it's you, it's not Star Wars. Okay, right. <laughs> the relationship is over, Zach. You shouldn't Ooh. have done it. Some things you shouldn't confess. <laughs> And you, you guys need to know. Well, that wait a minute. What, Eric what's, has put Star Wars everywhere you look around here. These little. Which movie did you start with? Which movie did you start with? Well, I accidentally started with Solo, and then and then I went and watched the original two. <laughs> it's totally your problem. Okay. Star Wars is not the problem. Okay. Zach, I don't. I'm not into it either. I don't, I don't get it. Matthew Porter's here. Yesterday, Matthew stole and ate a Snickers from his kid's Halloween stack, but then he discovered something disturbing inside the candy. 37 grams of carbs. Too much. How, it's too how much. could you? It's, it was a mistake, and I regret it. Our video director, John Myers, is in the tech bunker, and our producer, Jinx, is working hard in the little glass booth Together, they're the eyes and the ears of Steve Brown, etc. And of course, Kathy is here, Kathy Wyatt. She's the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy just finished assembling her beautiful Christmas village. Took her three weeks. And you know what that means? <laughs> it means this weekend <laughs> it's time to create Valentine Day cards. <laughs> oh my goodness! He's ahead of the one, game, one step ahead. Oh, <laughs> That's so bad. It's not even Thanksgiving, Kathy. Listen, you don't care in the first place. So why are we even talking about it? I would just like I to bring up. Deeply. No, you don't. I would just like to bring up. Are you all aware that this is the second week in a row that we have been fortunate enough to be able to interview a British brother? Yeah, they, Last week we had Oz Guinness, and I now know. we have N.T. Wright. I, does, does it get any better than this? Well, they do talk funny. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, N.T. Wright is the former bishop of Durham in the Church of England, one of the world's leading Bible scholars. He's also quite controversial. We may talk about that in a bit. He currently serves as the chair of New Testament and early Christianity at the School of Divinity at the University of St. Andrews. For 20 years, N.T. taught, and we refer to him as his good friends, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> For 20 years, Tom taught New Testament studies at Cambridge, McGill, and Oxford Universities. He's been featured on ABC News, Dateline, The Colbert Report, and Fresh Air. Um, he's written numerous books, uh, I think over 80. That's crazy. Wow. And wow. <laughs> his wife is more sane than that. She reads mysteries at home. That enables her to live with a theologian. <laughs> and his latest book which, as you can see, I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is titled History and Eschatology, Jesus and the Promise of Natural Theology. And some of you are saying, 
like, what? <laughs> yes, yes, we are. <laughs> you know, in a, I often suggest with some of the authors that we interview that uh, that people ought to get their book and use it for a small Bible study uh, throughout the church. Uh huh. I'm thinking a seminary class on this one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is not one that you want for your small group Bible study. It's heavy going. It's delightfully written. It has incredible insights, but none of you are going to understand it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Tom, as before, you're going to have to keep the fodder down low for normal people because, you know, we, we don't know what eschatology is. We don't know what natural theology is. We do know Jesus, but... <laughs> But, but we're he, not sure of that. So, but he's going to tell us <laughs> yes, what those right. things are. Tom, thank you for being with us and for uh, accepting our kidding around with you. I guess maybe, and and I and and this will be just for purposes of clarification. And I, you know, I know that you give. You know, like I think there were the last time between two guys, there were 12 definitions of natural theology. But could you kind of tell us what in the world natural theology is? Do you study theology when you're naked? Or do you, are, are you, do you, uh, is it something else? T tell us uh, about it. My money's on something else. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. The phrase natural theology has been used in a number of ways for many years, actually going back to at least the Middle Ages and beyond that in a different sense to the classical world around the time of Christianity and uh, the birth of Christianity and before. But broadly speaking, it talks about what happens when you look at the natural world, at the trees and the sky and the flowers and the birds and the human mind and so on, and you say to yourself, if all this stuff is what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, then uh, is there a God? And if so, what might this God be like? Now, the problem with that is that many people have said, if God is the creator of the world, then the world might reflect him in some ways, but the world won't necessarily reveal everything about God. You might get a distorted view of God that way. Maybe God has to reveal himself um, in some other way. But in the 18th century, when this present debate really got going, around the time that you as a nation got going, which is actually not unconnected, then people were thinking in terms of what we call deism, which is if there's a God, he's kind of outside the system, he looks down, and uh, we may be able to guess something about him from down here, but how do we know, and what sort of a God is this? But at the same time, people were saying, is there a way of proving the existence of God without appealing to the special Christian revelation, to Jesus, to the Bible, etc.? In other words, could we convince the skeptic uh, by just looking around at the world and arguing up from there? Now, my problem with the ways we've gone about it is that the ways we've gone about it have usually bracketed Jesus out of the question. But Jesus was and is a real human being. He was a real part of first century Middle Eastern history. If we're talking about the natural world, he belongs in that world of nature or of creation. Uh, you know, he ate, he drank, he slept, uh, he lived, he died. Um, why can't we look at Jesus and then discern things about God from there? That's a, a harder question than it sounds because it raises the question of history, of how you know things in history. And so this book, is really about history, as it says, but also this blessed word eschatology. I have to say, uh, one of my own children looked at the title of the book and said, oh, it's that long word, and I can never remember what it means. And I said, yeah, I understand that. But, but, but in the business, you have to use shorthands, like, you know, physicists use shorthands, biologists use shorthands. So eschatology is shorthand for saying that the Jews of Jesus' day were expecting God's future to arrive in the present. God had promised that he would do certain things and that they were longing for these things to happen. And would this be the end of the world or would it be the end of the present world order or what? 
And what we find in the New Testament as a historical document is precisely a claim about God's future arriving in the present in and through Jesus himself. And so that is the starting point, what I believe is the real starting point, for saying, now, let's start with this place and see what that tells us, not only about God, but actually also about the world of nature, about the world of creation. And so the argument kind of bends back on itself. And I'm sorry if you find it a bit dense. Um, and yes, it was, <laughs> it, it was really intended for kind of seminarians and to, to contribute to the debate. It was originally the Gifford Lectures, which I gave in Aberdeen last year. And uh, that, that's the kind of lecture, lecture series where you don't spare the horsepower. You're really going for it. And so that's, that's what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. So hopefully there will be quite a few people who will actually enjoy it and get a lot out of it. You know, they, uh, didn't Carl, uh, Carl Bart did, uh, did the Gifford Lectures at one time, didn't he? Yeah. He did, but he spent his Gifford lectures denying that you could do natural theology. <laughs> which, <I'm bored. laughs> which, which was a kind of a, a, an odd take on, on that because the Gifford lectures are supposed to be about natural theology. And, and so that, that was a bit of a puzzle to many people. <laughs> he probably said nine and then made an obscene gesture and walked off. <laughs> well, I don't know about the gesture, but certainly the nine. Because, and this, uh, this is part of the problem that in the 1930s, the German leadership under Hitler was saying, OK, let's do natural theology. What we see in nature is that God has raised up the German nation to lead the world. And Barth was saying no to that, to the political aspects of what was called natural theology. Tom, and we'll be back. Then, Hold it. About. Hold it. OK. Put your finger there. We'll talk on the other side of the break. N.T. Wright, one of the uh, great Bible scholars of the world, and uh, that he would take his time to be with us is uh, a very big gift. The name of his book, by the way, and uh, you, it's not easy. Uh, it's written mostly for those who are in seminary, but it's understandable by normal people if you're willing <laughs> to take the time and stay with it You'll mine some pearls that'll make a major difference. On the other side of the break, Tom, we were, uh, I brought up in a kidding way, Carl Bart and his, um, you know, uh, his total rejection. And that was the whole argument between he and his former friend, Emil Bruner. Right, um, yeah. And, and I, uh, but, you know, I was just joking around. But but once we got to talking about there's a real issue there. I mean, there are some that would say that the Gifford lectures are useless just because of the natural theology that they promote and that that's the way to create a Hitler. Would you comment on it some? Sure. Um what happened was that Hitler, or rather his, his tame theologians, they shamelessly used the phrase natural theology in order to try to suggest that this movement in history, which was the, the, the emergence of the powerful German nation after the First World War and the new reawakening after the Weimar Republic, so in the 1930s, that this was somehow a great historical moment and you could deduce from that that this must be God's will. Now, what they were doing was piggybacking on some very dubious 19th century philosophy from people like Hegel, for whom there was a kind of spirit, capital S spirit, at work automatically within the processes of the world. And this spirit would do one, now one thing, now the other, but it would gradually get where it was going and this was the way that utopia was going to arrive, or perhaps the kingdom of God was going to arrive, or something. And many in Germany and in Europe at the time, in the 1930s, really did believe that the world was developing, evolving. This is part of the 
the uh, abuse, if you like, of the theory of evolution, that the world was evolving in a particular way, politically and socially, as well as biologically, and that all you had to do was get on board and utopia would arrive. And of course, that was a huge, enormous disappointment in the 19, early 1940s when that didn't happen. But Bart had seen it coming because he said, this is idolatry. We're worshipping what is essentially a human power trip. And so that, that's why he rejected natural theology. And the question then for us is whether he was actually, as we say, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Mm. Um, and and uh, ever since then, and actually the later Bart, Bart in the 1950s, when he's writing the later volumes of Church Dogmatics, was much more open to seeing things in history, and especially Jesus himself, in ways which in his earlier days he would have been very worried about. So my aim in this book is to come round the back of that debate and say, I understand why people took the views they did in the 1930s, but we shouldn't be constrained now in nearly 2020 by one particular very difficult and unpleasant moment in German history of 90 years ago. Um, let's actually do the first century work, the first century historical work, and see how the New Testament actually asks us to read it. And that's what I spent my life doing is trying to read the New Testament in its historical context. Mm. And so that is the foundation then for what I'm trying to do. But it, one of the longest chapters in the book, as you'll have seen, is chapter three, which is on the meaning of history. And the word history is much more complicated than people usually realize. And you need to tease it out and lay out the different senses before you can then say, now, this is how history works. And it's an abuse of history to do with it what Hitler and his tame theologians were doing. Were you, um, just as an aside, and then I'm going to Matthew, but how were, at the lectures, um, you were saying things that are not often said at the Gifford lectures. Were you received, were you received well? Oh, yes. I was received in a very friendly spirit. Aberdeen is a cheerful and lively academic community, and that's where I gave the lectures. The point is that I was the first New Testament scholar since Rudolf Bultmann in 1955 to be asked to do the Giffords. And so I thought, OK, um, and he called his lectures History and Eschatology as well. That's why I used that title, though, with a different subtitle. And so, um, yeah, it was exciting to have that chance because normally they invite philosophers or sociologists um, and, and very, very seldom biblical scholars. So that's why I was pitching in from my particular angle. My vote would be you and not Boltman, but that's okay. <laughs> well, I have a I have a long critique of Boltman in the book, as you'll have seen. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I, this is a new kind of area of of, of study uh, for for me, but it's really interesting. And if I'm understanding correctly, without oversimplifying, it's it's a way of possibly understanding uh, more about God through the lens of history. What is history itself, apart from what the Bible says, say about God or suggest about God? But is there an inherent problem as as far as what we understand is history? By that I mean the idea like that winners write the stories. Is there a skepticism well, inherent about history? There, there, there's a bit of that. Um, one always has to be suspicious of any sources up to a point. But w when you're doing history, you are assembling all the evidence that you've got, which isn't just the written record, it's archaeological stuff and it's coins and it's anything that you can get to put the story together. And then it's a question of history working much like the natural sciences to say, how do we get in the data? How do we do so in a simple fashion as possible? And how do we shed light on other problems? That's what physicists do. And with the change in subject matter, of course, it's what historians do. So that's what I and many others are trying to do. And when you do that with Jesus in the first century, it's remarkable what you find. And that's what I've been exploring. Tom, uh, we may not get to it because we're coming up on a break, but we may be moving into it at this point. But you, uh, I noticed that you write that a historian is not unlike a scientist, and you were just talking about that a little bit. And I was wondering if you could talk about some ways that they are alike. Well, they're alike in that they all want all the data on the table. They all then look at the data and form a hypothesis. That is to say, this is how I think it works. The difference there is that the historian is looking for human intentionality, whereas a physicist is not looking for that. 
But the, the historian can perfectly easily study that, whether it's on the causes of the First World War or the reason why Jerusalem fell in AD 70 or whatever. And then it's alike in that you test the hypotheses against the data, you put it out to public tender and you say, everyone have a go, have a go at this. And then you modify the hypothesis. And so the process goes on. Hmm. That's good. Wow. Yeah. Listen, uh, you guys ought to get a copy of this book. You know, we've been reading the how-to books, how to be happy in Jesus, even if you're fat and or things like that. <laughs> Can I borrow Some, a copy of that, by the way? <laughs> and sometimes you need to feed your mind. And this book will do it. It's not easy going, but it is doable. And when you finish, you'll rise up and call N.T. Wright blessed for having <laughs> written it. The name of the book is History and Eschatology, Jesus and the Promise of Natural Theology. Guys, we're going to back out for a little bit. Got to pay for this, and it's hard work, and we'll have some cookies and milk. But like Jesus, and don't go away, we're coming back. Steve Brown, etc. And if somebody asks you, you tell them and turn your nose up and say something like, and you're not. By the way, our guest is N.T. Wright and his newest book uh, at the end of 80 previous books <laughs> is History and Eschatology, Eschatology, Jesus and the Promise of Natural Theology. And by the way, if you want to get all things N.T. Wright, go to ntwrightpage.com, and you'll be glad you did. In a previous segment, you said it's important that we really define what we mean by history, and we kind of blew past that. And I'm wondering if you could give us a, a, an overview. I know you've written a lot uh, on that, but yeah. uh, can, you, can you give us some high points? People often slide to and fro between different meanings. I remember during the Arab Spring in 2011, Hillary Clinton said it's important to be on the right side of history, which presumably meant that we know that history, i.e. human events, are moving in a particular direction, and what we need to do is recognize where they're going and go there. Actually, she was totally wrong. The events there were not moving in the direction she thought at all. But that's only one meaning of the word history, and that means a sort of a process which we can somehow discern and get on board with. But properly speaking, there are three meanings to the three main meanings to the word history. One is stuff that happened. Um, two is people writing about stuff that happened. That's very different. And the third is the task of researching and in order to write about the stuff that happened. So the Second World War is history in the sense that it's stuff that happened. Churchill's history of the Second World War is his take on it, his writing up of it. And then what historians do when they research and they look at archives, they are doing history in the sense of exploring and researching. People, especially in theology and in Christian circles, slide to and fro. And with Jesus, people talk about the historical Jesus. And sometimes they mean the Jesus who actually lived and died and walked around, around and so on. And sometimes they mean the Jesus that the historians have reconstructed. And there's a huge amount of slippage between those two. So it's important if we're going to talk sense about Jesus to know what we mean by that and indeed how the discipline of history actually works. And that's why, as I said before, chapter three of that book that you got in your hand is quite long and quite careful because I'm fed up with watching people slide around it and, and make mistakes as they do so. So for the average person who's listening, um, who maybe isn't, uh, doesn't read a whole lot of theology or, um, you know, spend a lot of time in this kind of discussion, what, what comes out of this? Like, why is this important? Why does this, why does understanding this make a difference in just your everyday life? 
Okay. Um, th there are all sorts of connections to everyday life. I'm not sure I can pinpoint them all in one sentence, but when you look at Jesus in his historical context, there are two things particularly which stand out, which the average Western Christian simply doesn't get. Hmm. One is that a lot of the story is focused somehow or other on the temple in Jerusalem, but the temple in Jerusalem was the place where heaven and earth came together, the first century Jews believed. And Jesus is upstaging the temple and doing and saying things which imply that he is the temple in person, that he is the place where heaven and earth meet. That sheds a flood of light on all sorts of things that modern Western Christians usually don't even think about. Mm. The other thing is the Sabbath, that uh, in, in ancient Judaism and in modern Judaism, the Sabbath isn't just an odd rule that Jews have to keep. Every week, the Sabbath is an anticipation of the age to come. So when Jesus says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, he means that something is happening now which brings God's future plans bang into the present. And so that's why Jesus does odd things on the Sabbath and doesn't seem to care about what he's doing, breaking the Sabbath, because as far as he's concerned, the whole of the present time is a new day, is God's new day coming from the future into the present to meet us. Those give shape and body historically to a lot that we know about Jesus and enable us to understand his agenda, why he did what he did, why the early church saw that he really had brought God's kingdom on earth as in heaven, and that they then had in the power of the spirit to work out what that was gonna mean in practice. Now, these things I say clearly, we know as historians that that's how first century Jews thought, and we can see what it would mean to put Jesus into the middle of that mix. I have found that really exciting mm -hmm. as a biblical scholar to explore that. And from there, you go into all sorts of things about what does the kingdom actually mean today? Mm. You know, we're probably not going to be able to discuss it because we're up, getting up closer to a break. But I, on the other side of the break, I would like you to, to address... Uh, here, and I assume there too, uh, there is a lot of political and academic turmoil. Um, and Christians, thoughtful Christians, react to that both in the academic community and uh, in the political one with a great deal of anxiety and fear and questions. I think once you get what you're saying and what you're saying is true, it dissipates a lot of that fear. And I'd like for you to talk about it on the other side of the break, but there is a break, so we'll use that as a teaser. A teaser is that which brings listeners back after we sell product. <laughs> so the name of the book, by the way, is History and Eschatology. Jesus and the Promise of Natural Theology. It absolutely, uh, or incidentally, is the Gifford Lectures that were given in 2018. Don't go anyplace. There's good stuff to come. Cindy Wright, and again, this book, and you ought to get it. Uh, it's worth the time you'll invest in it because it will have incredible implications to your life story. The book is History and Eschatology, Jesus and the Promise of Natural Theology. Tom, uh, before the break, I had mentioned the turmoil that we certainly are experiencing academically and politically and socially uh, in America. So, so we'll be in Britain, by the way. <laughs> okay, I, I thought maybe. Uh, <laughs> I was going to run and join you, but it's not. No, in, don't, do, don't bother, don't do right? <laughs> but what I was asking is that as you talk about these particular issues, uh, about uh, Jesus being a part of history and an important part. The Christians who are enmeshed in this turmoil 
it creates a good deal of anxiety. And the question was, can you help? Well, I'd love to be able to help. Um, often when a doctor is asked to help, the doctor has to diagnose the disease first and then apply appropriate medicine, which might be quite drastic. Um, and one of the things that I see in the 18th century when your constitution was written, we in Britain, of course, are just muddled because we don't have a written constitution, but we have some of the same problems, is that the split between heaven and earth, which caused the problem about natural theology and also caused the problem about talking about Jesus within history, that same split was written into your constitution, into modern France, and into many European cultures, the idea that God and the world are quite separate. Now, you can live like that for a while, but then there's a blowback moment. And it seems to me, particularly in America right now, that's what you're suffering from, that you've had 200 years where people have said church and state are totally separate, faith and politics just don't mix. And now you're discovering that actually um, theology abhors a vacuum, just like nature does, mm -hmm. and that suddenly things are rushing together in an unhealthy way, and then people get upset and disturbed. And the answer has to be you need to go right back, take a long, cool look at it. And I would hope that my book will help with that, even yeah. though it isn't primarily about, about politics as such, because at the heart of the historical message of Jesus is the announcement that this is the time for God mm -hmm. to become king. Now, wasn't God always king? Well, yes and no. Jesus had to do something in his life, and particularly his death, which would overthrow the powers of evil and start a new project in which Jesus himself would be exercising world rule on God's behalf. Now, people say, well, look out of the window. That obviously hasn't happened. Or read the newspaper. It doesn't look as if Jesus is in charge. But then you go back to the Sermon on the Mount and you say, when Jesus is in charge, it doesn't look like God sending in the tanks. It looks like God sending in the meek and the mourners and the brokenhearted and the hungry for justice people. And by the time the bullies have woken up to what's going on, the meek and the hungry for justice people have built schools and hospitals and looking after the poor, and they are transforming the world. Now, the whole project of the 18th century enlightenment, and in a way, this book is a response to that whole project, has tried to rubbish Christianity and said, Christianity will save your soul and get to heaven if there is a heaven, but we'll run the world, thank you very much. And my whole project is to go back to the New Testament and say, that's not how it was meant to be. Jesus is Lord, God raised him from the dead, and under his lordship and through his means, which is not through violence, but through humble self-giving love, then the world is being rescued. And that rescue is going ahead, whether we in the media or whatever choose to notice it or not. The trouble is that we've got so tangled up with other issues that people get really upset and cross if you try to joggle them out of their safe, safe zone. But that safe zone has been under threat for a long time now, and we're now paying the price on both sides of the Atlantic, I should say. There you are. That's a small comfort. Oh, it, it's not a small. Right, hmm. If we can get the history right, we have at least a start on what the kingdom of God ought to mean. Hmm. You know, theoretically, I'm uh, obviously you're hopeful because the king's still on the throne and nobody elected him and nobody will ever depose him and all of that. Personally, when you kind of move away and look at this, are you hopeful? Do you see hopeful signs? Um, the, the hope, uh, somebody asked old Bishop Leslie Newbegin once whether he was an optimist or a pessimist, and he said, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. In other mm, words, the yeah. hope lies in the fact that when God raised Jesus from the dead, new creation really was launched, and that in the power of the Spirit, Jesus' followers have the vocation and responsibility to be working at that new creation. And if anyone finds the early chapters of that book uh, a little chewy, then I suggest that they skip to the last two chapters where I'm talking <laughs> about Jesus' death and resurrection and the power of the Spirit, and that will actually show where it's all going. Mm. You, you said uh, as a doctor you have to diagnose the issue, and then you said you might need to prescribe a radical treatment. What would that radical treatment be? <laughs> Jesus, uh, dummy. Radical treatment, would, <laughs> radical treatment might, might be that we all repent corporately of the ways in which we have thought, particularly about 
putting God upstairs somewhere and saying God has nothing to do with our constitution, with our state, etc. Now, I know you Americans have in God we trust on the dollar bills, but um, and we have similar things, of course, in our culture. But there's a sense in which uh, Western society in general, Europe as well, has tried to keep God out of the equation and then doesn't know what it would be like if you actually say, if God is God, God belongs in the equation and not outside. And those political issues are always swirling around the back of debates about natural theology. And that's one reason why I hope this book might just be important. Mm. This uh, question, and we don't have a lot more time, but it's interesting. I, you, you want to ask, why is there so much effort, so much money, so much leverage, uh, directed at getting God out of the public square or as part of our lives or part of our history or part of our milieu that it, it, goes, it goes back to the 18th century again, when there had been wars of religion in Europe and when people, some of the founding fathers of America, were looking back at Europe and saying, well, we don't want to be like that, because they saw those societies as theocratic, um, as, as mad clergy claiming to have a hotline to God. We don't want to do that. But instead, of course, what you get is mad politicians claiming to have a hotline to <laughs> something or other. <laughs> Which has, which, has led, which has led us on both sides of the Atlantic into all kinds of trouble. And actually, the Bible and the message of Jesus ought to give us a better handle on what God's kingdom really should look like. Oh, Tom, we're out of time. And I want you to, and I want you to know this has been a delightful hour, and uh, we are flattered that you would spend it with us. As always... Uh, we're overwhelmed with your wisdom and your insight and your scholarship. You write another book, we're going to find out some dirt on you <laughs> and, uh, and get you back again. And God Thank you very much. Good talking to you guys. Hey, it's same here, and God bless you. Guys, we're going we're gonna to back out, rest up, and then we're going to come back and tell you who we're going to do it unto next week. Dale? Whoever it is will have an accent, but it will be Chinese. I just <laughs> want you to know it. Anybody ask you, the name of the program is Steve Brown, etc. Don't go anywhere. you know it or not, but you were very fortunate to have listened to that hour. Uh, that was profound That's beyond good. words. And um, and there's a reason that N.T. Wright is, uh, and he's controversial, by the way. I wanted to ask him how he deals with ki that kind of controversy per personally. I bet we would have gotten some great answers. But at any rate, a brilliant scholar who loves Jesus with all of his heart, and he brings his scholarship to that love and then offers it to God's people. And he is truly a gift. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I was thinking about drugs before I came into this <laughs> studio. <laughs> And I feel a lot better, man. Did you I take them? Feel, what? No. <laughs> We're out of time, everybody. They're sitting, <laughs> sitting on my desk, and I was going to, and I don't have to now. Back to the I've confessions. I've talked to Dr. Wright. <laughs> exactly. But, but it, it was a profound hour, and it's a lot more profound than any of us even know because he's going places where if we don't go in our culture, we're going to. We're, we're going to be in more trouble than we are right now. We're already under it. So, great hour. You're welcome, by the way. <laughs>
Yeah, you how know. did you get him, Kathy? You know what's really funny? Did he forget that he had been on this before? I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what's really funny uh, about all that? The f- well, there's two things that are funny. After I wrote to him, and of course, I, you know, it was like, good morning, Dr. Wright, or dear Dr. Wright, or whatever. And then, you know, and everything is signed Tom. And I'm like, yeah, right. Like, I'm going to say hi, Tom, to N.T. Wright. But that, so that was the first funny, funny part. The second funny part is that I was thinking back like 20 years ago when we first started this, and it was two hours every morning. What were were we thinking when we were three, three hours. hours? I mean, and what were we thinking when we did that? But it was like beating a dead horse, which I've never done. But it was horrible trying to get guests because you know, nobody had a clue what this program was or anything like that. And now it's like, and and I don't want to make it sound bigger than what it is because we're not NBC or CNN or anything like that. But I mean, it's just amazing that that people remember that PR people remember, you know, who Steve Brown, et cetera, is, and it's just not as difficult as it used to be. All that being said, next week, talk about a complete 180. Uh, Jennifer Greenberg is a young woman who's written a book titled Not Forsaken, and it is her personal story. Um, uh, The subtitle is How Faith Brought One Woman from Victim to Survivor. She was abused horrifically by her father. Oh, man, that ought to be a fun fun hour, you think? Yeah. (laughs) Hey, guys. We are going to show next week, same time, same place. It's our fond hope that you join us. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. That gives you a wide, wide berth.